Hello, everyone. My name is Diego Serrano, and I'm the Director of Engineering at the Panasonic Device Solutions Lab in Massachusetts. And today I'm going to be presenting our work entitled 0.25 degree per hour close to bulk acoustic wave gyroscope. So MEMS inertial sensors continue to play a critical role in many emerging spaces. In particular, uh, MEMS gyroscopes are expected to be of uh, great importance in the automotive space for high-end applications such as driver assistance systems and autonomous vehicles. Now in these spaces, they're expected to help uh, complement and assist uh, GPS. And for this reason, um, MEMS gyro is not only required to have low noise, but also very high bandwidth so that they can detect very precise rotation rates at relatively large speeds. Uh, bulk acoustic wave gyroscopes are well suited for this type of applications uh, because they operate at high frequencies. Both gyros usually have a uh, much larger bandwidth when you compare them to uh, kilohertz type of devices with similar Q value. Now, the problem is that uh, these devices um, typically have inherently very large Q values. So in the past, uh, the way we've managed the bandwidth problem is by purposely reducing Q, uh, for example, in, in this case, we added extra perforations to reduce the uh, Q from thermoelastic damping, giving us bandwidth in tens of hertz for industrial grade applications. The problem is that um, for applications that require much lower noise, or very high Qs are desired. Also, in uh, devices that are implemented in single crystal silicon, uh, Q can change up to 100% over the whole temperature range. So if you want a stable, relatively stable bandwidth across temperature, uh, complicated qualization backend circuits are needed to, to keep this bandwidth uh, constant. So an obvious alternative is to uh, move from an open loop architecture to a closed loop architecture like um, a forced to rebalance system. So uh, in, in the past few years, we switch our approach to incorporate this in our system. Uh, so as before, we have a, a, a drive loop where we have amplitude regulation and phase control to guarantee that the drive mode is always excited at resonance with a constant drive velocity, which um, is fed back into the, this drive electrodes. On the sense path, we have very low noise, front end electronics, feed through cancellation, and then demodulation to extract the rate signal. That signal is digitized and sent to a DSP for further processing. And then what's new in our system is now we remodulate that signal and feed it back into this uh, force to rebalance electrodes to keep the um, sense displacement uh, close to zero. Now, as before, we also have a quadrature cancellation loop that takes a 90 degree signal. It gets digitized and controlled and that generates uh, some large voltage DC signals that are fed back into the quadrature electrodes of the MAMS to keep that 90 degree component close to zero. And this is an image of our latest part, uh, which is around two by two millimeters uh, and wire bonded to the interface electronics, which includes everything that you can see in the system here and wire bonded to our package. Now, um, the, the gyro device that we use as in previous generations still operates with the uh, N equal to three degenerate modes of a disk uh, and operates at a frequency of 4.84 megahertz. 
Now, what's different is that our quality factors are significantly larger in the order of 350,000. And this was achieved by reducing thermoelastic damping, by um, minimizing or keeping the number of release holes to a minimum, and simplifying the decoupling structure. We also improved the thin film damping of the part by wafer level packaging the devices at a much lower pressure level. So in the order of 0.5 Tor, which is um, 10 to 20 X improvement compared to previous generations, which were around five to 10 Tor. Now, even though the isolation structure uh, is simpler than previous generation, it was significantly improved to uh, keep the device well isolated from the substrate, which improved the temperature performance. Now, um, when it comes to the no system level noise of the part, uh, we obviously, as we mentioned before, want to improve the quality factor as much as possible, but we want to look for other places where noise can be improved. So if we look at common sources of noise, we can think of the MEMS mechanical uh, noise of uh, the, the sense mode. So the contribution of thermal noise of the sense mode and uh, the contribution of the front end sense electronics, which um, uh, it's a combination of thermal and flicker noise. Now, obviously here we can see that increasing Q improves uh, the, the overall noise of the system, uh, but another Good approach to reduce noise is to increase the drive velocity here noted as the derivative of the drive displacement Q drive. And when we look at the results for how the noise of the system depends on this Q drive, we can see that as we increase its value, the thermal noise, which is shown here as the ARW region of an Allen deviation plot, uh, decreases accordingly, but unfortunately the bias instability of the part does not improve. Uh, this is an indication that the, the main source of this bias instability is not from the flicker noise of the front end electronics. So to better understand where this noise source is coming from, we can look into this equation and note that this drive velocity in the denominator comes from input referring all sources of noise by dividing them by the Coriolis force. Now, if that is the case, that means that the source of noise uh, for this, this flicker that does not change with Q drive must be proportional to, to this Q drive so that when it's included in the equation, it becomes independent of its value. And the obvious place where this could be coming from is from the upconversion of drive loop noise caused by the nonlinear capacitive transducers. And um, once we include that um, into our equation, of total noise, we can see that um, that expression is in fact proportional to Q drive and uh, depends on the sources of noise, both thermal and flicker in the drive loop. Now, the question is what can we do to now reduce this, this flicker noise contribution and further reduce our bias instability? Well, a, an obvious answer is, well, reduce the noise of the drive electronics but we can also see that this expression depends on the polarization voltage of the device. So by reducing the voltage across these nonlinear transducers, uh, we can decrease the nonlinearity and therefore the upconversion of noise and that lowers the VI. So in this Allen deviation plot here, we can see that uh, we can reduce in this particular example, the bias instability from around 1.5 dPH to 0.5 dPH, which is almost a linear relationship with how VP has been reduced. So this is a, a good method 
to further reduce uh, the overall noise in the system. Now, the challenge of reducing VP to manage noise is that it obviously reduces the quadrature cancellation and tuning range of the part. So if we take, for example, here, the expression for our frequency tuning, we can see that for positive polarization voltages VP and tuning voltages VT, the maximum tuning range that we can get is when VT is equal to VP. So this term goes to zero. So obviously the maximum amount of tuning we can get is basically proportional to VP squared. So reducing VP has a great impact and how much frequency tuning we can get out of the part. In this plot, we can see the overall tuning range for different VP values, which uh, cuts down significantly as we reduce it. Now, a simple solution to this problem is to invert the polarity of, of VP. So make VP negative. And by doing this, by looking at this expression again, we see that if VP is now negative, the maximum tuning range is now proportional to that negative VP minus the maximum uh, available uh, tuning voltage. And it has a quadratic relationship. So in this dotted line, we can see that for a negative VP of minus five volt and for the same positive tuning voltage VT, we can get a much larger tuning range than what we could get with this positive VP uh, values. Now, the real challenge is, well, how do you incorporate this into an integrated circuit? And, and that's precisely what we did in this work. Uh, we implemented a, a negative charge pump in a standard CMOS process by inverting the stages of a Dixon charge pump and obviously playing some tricks to guarantee that none of the diode stages are uh, reverse biased. Here are uh, some of the noise results for a, a device at uh, 4.8 megahertz with a quality factor of 350. Thousand uh, utilizing our force turbines architecture and a polarization voltage of minus five volt using the integrated charge pump in our ASIC. And here we can see that the device has a, uh, an angle white noise of 0 0.0 uh, to one arc seconds per root hertz for an 800 hertz bandwidth, which is the bandwidth extension we get from the force to rebalance architecture and other angle random walk of 0 0.017 degree per root hour, and an LN deviation in the bias and stability region of around 0.25 degree per hour. In this slide, we have uh, the very good temperature response we get out of this part. So here in this plot, we see the uncompensated response, and then the compensated ZRO, zero rate output, after calibration with our digital architecture, backend digital architecture, and then zooming in uh, in the range of minus 60 to 110 degrees C, uh, we get uh, around 0 0.05 um, degrees per second of maximum deviation from zero. And then, um, in terms of overall bandwidth, as I mentioned before, the force to rebalance architecture extends our bandwidth to uh, 800 hertz. And um, the overall bandwidth of the system is programmable with a digital filter of the output. And uh, in this plot, we can see uh, the response of our device when it's rotated at uh, this different frequency levels for three different filter settings. And here we can see 3 dB bandwidth uh, for the setting of 200 Hertz, demonstrating the extension of the band, the overall system bandwidth of the part. Thank you so much for listening to my presentation and uh, hope to see you in person at the meeting in May.